All right, let's get started with the review. So we are going to start by talking about our continuing ongoing project called Bruin Bot. Um, this is a project that's about three years old at this point. We started this in 2019 and then continued it off and on with interruptions from COVID and lab closure and all of those things. But we were able to do a lot of work virtually and this fall quarter we came in and we started doing hands-on assembly as well as CAP. So we'll get into that. All right, so um, my name is Zach. I'm the Bruin Bot Mechanical Lead. Um, fall quarter has mainly been focused on just familiarizing the whole team with the CAD and also just making some small adjustments here and there so that we can start prototyping this quarter. Um, so I'll just start off with the arm assembly here. Uh, so going down the list, so first we added some additional mounting points for those external sleeve components on the arm. Um, just additional mounting points on those aluminum rods uh, just to make sure that it's more stable and secure um, as the arm is moving. Um, next, we also mounted the shoulder connector closer to the motor shaft. Um, originally, it was mounted kind of far along the motor shaft, and uh, we didn't foresee any issues with that based on like the loads that we would see on the shaft, but we just felt that mounting it closer would reduce that risk even further. Um, we also mounted the limit switch inside the shoulder assembly. Um, it's kind of hard to see in that bottom right picture, um, but we're working on making that like limit switch mount uh, adjustable. Uh, in the horizontal direction, just so we can precisely determine like what the home location for the arm is. Um, we also redesigned the shoulder motor mount to fit the new motor that we selected uh, last spring. And it also accommodates like more of the bolt placement on the chassis. And finally, we redesigned the hand tray to have more of an appearance of like a paw, because before it was just kind of like a tray. And we also felt that it didn't match the aesthetic of the rest of the robot. So you can see that in the top right picture there. Uh, moving on to the payload. Um, the only change we made here is kind of redesigning it to use like a locking mechanism where um, before we were planning on using adhesive to hold everything together. Um, we feel that this will like really help us with uh, ease of assembly and disassembly and also aids in modularity in case we want to like swap out parts. We don't have to rebuild the whole thing. Um, and lastly, we have been manufacturing some of the drivetrain parts. Um, I think Rebecca will talk about the design of that, but uh, we also had some help from Jacob. And the bottom right picture there, you can see some of the parts that the members have manufactured uh, just on the mill and the lathe. Yeah, so we made a lot of changes to the drivetrain system before the quarter actually started. Um, the picture on the left there is the old system. Um, and as you can see, there's quite a jarring difference between uh, the system we had in place and what we redesigned it to. So we had the six wheeled configuration with kind of a suspension system um, and U joints. So it was this very flexible system. However, um, based on where the existing design was at, a lot of the parts were planned to be 3D printed um, because we didn't necessarily have the budget to buy six different U-joints and all the different components that go with that. So we really had some questions about whether the system was going to be feasible. Um, and just in terms of the difficulty of manufacturing and assembling all of those parts, uh, we changed the design to just a simple four wheel drive system, which is less adaptable to rough terrain, you know, and it potentially is less shock absorbing. Um, but overall, given the purpose of this robot to go on flat ground, we figured that it was more important to have a feasible design than one that was so um, flexible and shock, shock absorbing. So the new design just has those four wheels um, with two drive motors, so it's a tank drive system. Um, there are a couple of parts that we use the lathe and the mill to create to lock those wheels onto their axles. Um, and then that's sort of an ongoing process. So that was one of the main things we accomplished this quarter within drive, uh, Brew and Bot Mechanical. What was the, the accomplishment was building the parts or the accomplishment was designing the parts? Uh, both, so designing happened over the summer before the quarter started. Um, we created that whole design. And then during fall quarter, 
the members of the Broomabout mechanical team worked together to do the manufacturing. Cool. Yeah. Yeah, we made a lot of progress. It was good. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Sohan. Uh, I'm part of the circuits and controls team and for Broombot. Um, we first started working on the drive chain system by testing out the two CAM12 motors that we have. Um, these motors are each controlled by a Talent SR motor controller. Uh, so we first had to calibrate these using PWM signals within the right range. Um, and then we use Arduino to take in joystick input and output um, the right PW PWM signal that controls the motor speed and direction. Sweet. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Dylan, the sub team lead for circuits and controls. Uh, I worked on or did some work on the payload system, mainly the arm. As you can see on the right, the diagram is the basis for the wiring of how we're going to do the payload system. Right now, it only shows uh, the arm motor with the encoder and the motor driver. But once we get going, we'll also add uh, the motor for uh, the conveyor belt and uh, the servo motors for dispensers. And so we did uh, do some Arduino code for when we are back to in person and we can get back on hands on. So we could uh, start testing everything and, uh, and get going on that. Uh, you can go to the next slide. And just here's a visual of where we started at the beginning of the year and where we are now and working towards. So at the beginning of the year, we had this diagram on the left. It showed just the basic, what, uh, what we needed. And then as we kind of went along this year or last quarter, we got a clear idea of what, uh, what motors we need for certain systems, what systems we're going to use and ultimately not use. I guess uh, just to point out the key uh, differences in the picture, uh, on the right, we did add an addition of a head system. So there is a human-like uh, character to the robot. So a head will move and have neck motions. We did remove uh, the Arduino system that controls the sensor arrays and the GPS. But in order to maintain autonomy, autonomy, my bad, <laughs> we are gonna we are considering using a, a lidar system for uh, motion detection. So there will still be that uh, that sense of the robot sensing an object in front of it and stopping for the drivetrain. And also on the diagram, you could see the output devices of the different motors, what input devices we were going to need, and uh, various other things like that. Sweet, thank you. Hey everyone, I'm Nikhil. I'm the lead for Broombot Software. Um, so we kind of divided up software into three different things. Uh, the voice system, uh, the vision system and the web dashboard. So I was talking about the voice system first. Um, so for the voice system, we created a voice recognition software for the Broombot. Uh, so this allows users to actually speak to Broombot and interact with it. Some of the things you can ask Broombot are ask it to play music. You can play like a quick number game with it. Uh, you can ask what the weather is in LA. Um, you can ask for a fun fact. Uh, and we have about 10 different things you can ask Broombot currently. Uh, so technically speaking, it uses the Python text-to-speech library for speech output. Um, and for speech, um, for recognizing speech, we used a key-based recognition system uh, to see what the user was asking the bot. And then this plays nicely with the touchscreen panel on the Broombot, which displays nine buttons for users to interact with and tap. Uh, and also there's a button to sp uh, speak to the robot and talk to it. Um, yeah, so the next slide should show that. So this is a very rough prototype. I'm sorry, it's kind of blurry. I took a screenshot from a video, uh, but this is roughly what it'll look like. Uh, so the basic UI is three buttons at the top, uh, a button in the middle to actually speak to the robot and three buttons on the bottom that will continuously switch out uh, after a question's been asked. Next slide. All right, and then this also plays really nicely with the LED panel, which is the actual face of the robot. Um, so we used a serial connection between the Raspberry Pi and uh, the Arduino uh, to actually talk to the LED panel and display different faces on the robot. 
Um, and as people are interacting with the robot, the facial expression of the robot will change. So different questions, different things that you ask the robot will display different, uh, like a dis different LED face for the robot. Um, all right, moving on to our second team, uh, the Vision AI team. This is something we worked on two years ago, but we're starting to improve this year. Um, so we're working on integrating the vision detect detection algorithm that we had to work with the main Raspberry Pi. Um, and then also our current algorithm only detects legs, faces, and when it detects a face, it also detects uh, one of six different emotions. Um, but we want better uh, detection from our algorithm. So ideally detecting the tables on Brunewalk, uh, any animals or anything that's moving that's not part of the ground, we want to also be able to check that. So that's something we're going to be working on this year. And the third team that just started this year is the web dashboard team. Um, so this is going to include creating a web application to monitor different logs from the robot and the robot's status at any given time. Um, also, ideally, we could be able to control the robot through the web application. Uh, so we'll probably have to work very closely with the controls team on this. Um, and the third thing is also to view the camera stream that's coming from the robot to see what the robot's seeing and what's going on. And these last of the slides are what the face of the robot looks like. So Rebecca made some of these animations a while back for the LED panel. Um, so we've been playing around with these and having the LED panel change its face uh, based on uh, when users are talking to the robot. Um, so yeah, hopefully uh, we can add some more faces and some better, um, uh, some better uh, LEDs to it, yeah. Yeah, that's all. Yeah. Yeah, and just to clarify a lot of the stuff that Nikhil was talking about um, was not all done this quarter. Um, <laughs> Clearly, there's a yes, huge amount not. of work's gone into it. Um, yeah, so so a lot of these systems we had in place last year and the year before, but yeah, there are some new things that you talked about. Um, all right, so for the next steps in Bruin Bot, broken down by each team, you know, all of our teams are moving forward into the next quarter. Uh, the mechanical team is going to begin prototyping the systems other than drivetrain. Right now, we only have manufacturing done on drivetrain. So they're still working on CAD, but there are other 3D printed components um, and things that we could potentially could manufacture with limited lab access. Hopefully if we get more lab access, then we can continue manufacturing everything. So the payload system or the head system, um, putting everything together. Uh, circuits and controls is working on wi wiring, um, testing different components together. Um, and the head system right now, uh, they're kind of limited to working on the code for the Arduino sections because we don't have access to all the tools in the lab that would allow us to hook up components. Um, and then on the software side, as they mentioned, they're gonna update the they're gonna update the touchscreen UI. This is a little bit a little bit bold there, I would say. Um, more facial expressions, the web dashboard team that just started up, um, adding more objects, and then the finding a better voice. I think no one's super satisfied with the uh, the robot voice that it has right now. So that's part of the part of the the challenge. Yeah. So I should have mentioned this at the beginning that we're holding questions till the end of each section. Um, but so hopefully, if people had questions that they were thinking of while we were presenting that, um, maybe you guys could have a chance to ask them now. Just a thought regarding your tray. Um, moving it over to uh, assembly with keys, uh, really smart. Um, what material is that, did you say? The the tray, like the hand? No, the... the, or the, the I think the carriage. Oh, yeah, the, the carriage. yeah, payload carriage. Yeah, well, we're planning on laser cutting that uh, acrylic. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, there's some... That's a, that's a really smart idea there. Fantastic. Yeah, thank you. We got a question. Is the voice going to be pre-recorded lines or a text-to-speech kind of thing? Yeah. It's probably going to be a text-to-speech kind of thing. Uh, pre-recorded would just be way too much of a hassle to deal with. So we're trying to find a nice uh, text-to-speech voice that's already been made. 
Yeah. All right. Any other questions for Broombot? You talk about tank steering. Um, what are the requirements for the surface that it has to drive on? Is so it a carpet? Is it a... Yeah, so it's driving outdoors on UCLA campus, ideally. So that's a lot of flat brick or concrete surfaces. Um, so it's, it's specifically for outside on concrete? Like there yes. are not other surfaces that, that you're also required to drive on? Yeah, we pretty much would never be driving on grass or really rocky areas or uneven ground. Um, we just didn't feel it was important enough for the functionality of this robot to keep this old drivetrain system. Yeah, that one on the left was, was going to be a bear to build, I could tell you. Oh, yeah. And just sort of terrifying. <laughs> like, I just, the way that it looks, I don't know. I, I can't get my head around that. Um, yeah, we might be able to do slight uphills, but, but it depends on where the eventual center of mass of the robot is. The wheels are pretty high friction. The wheels are, are rubber. They're like, they're meant to be, you know, a pretty tough grip, but, um, probably like a steep hill. I'm not sure if it could do that. <gasps> a cat. <laughs> Very good. Okay. Any other questions? Uh, is there a plan to add any sort of suspension? Because, I mean, unless I misheard, it looks like those are some rigidly mounted wheels, right? And you're still going over brick outside. Um, any plan on approaching that at all? Yeah, they are rigidly mounted, um, which, yeah, might create sort of a, a shakiness. Um, yeah, I only the, worry because it's right. like shopping cart style body yeah. and it's really tall. Uh, <laughs> and you have a lot of important electronics at the top. Um, yeah, I mean, wheels, it doesn't have to be as insane as the old one, but just right. if you had any consideration. The wheels themselves have a pretty thick rubbery tire on them. So we're hoping that that's going to provide, you know, as much dampening as we can. Um, they're old, we're pretty sure they're old BattleBots wheels, um, but they've got about a half inch to three quarters of an inch of softer rubber on the outsides. Um, yeah, but there is currently no no suspension, so it's just sort of the compromise that we made. The center of mass is really, I think it's going to be really quite low, uh, especially if we put the battery in the bottom, because the motors right. are really quite heavy, and the battery is only going to be the other really heavy component. I, I mean, the, most, of the flame, most of the frame is plastic. Yeah, most, yeah, the, the chassis the is... The chassis itself is, like, ultra lightweight. Um, it's actually PVC pipe instead of metal. Um, which is a decision we made kind of ages ago. So there isn't, yeah, there isn't anything super heavy in it except in the bottom because the, the frame of the bottom is all made out of 80-20. So that's all aluminum and then the heaviest components are there. Almost everything on top is plastic. How do you um, assemble the frame? Of, if, if that's uh, PVC pipe, what, what are you using to make the corner joints and such? Uh, they're 3D printed connectors. Okay. Yeah, we had some some budget constraints uh, earlier in the design process. <laughs> I'll say that much. Um, so that's going to be something to evaluate is the the overall strength of the system. But yeah, that's that's how we decided to put it together. Do you know what kind of plastic you're using for your 3D printed parts? Um, we have printed a couple of them in PLA, probably ABS if we can work with that would be better. But right now, we just have some, on... right now we just have Sorry, some right now we just have some PLA high infill parts. Are you um, are you printing them on printers that you own yourselves, or are you using a UCLA lab printer? Uh, we've used the UCLA makerspace printers. And do they? I, I guess what do you know what model of printer they're uh, that they have there? Yeah, they're printed on uh, Prusa printers, which is the same one we have in the ASME lab. Um, okay. The only the only other ones we might have access to is there's some MAE department printers. There's some Stratasys printers that are pretty good that print in um, ABS that tends to have a much higher strength. Uh, I'm not sure if we'll be able to get access for that for this kind of project, though. The uh, Prusas can do ABS. Are you not yeah. allowed to switch the filament? Well, they you need to have an enclosure on it. 
Um, mm, that's true. We're only, we've only been allowed to print ABS on the Prusa printers if it's like a very small amount. If you're doing a long print on ABS, you need to have enclosure and ventilation. Um, there are other printers in the makerspace that have that, but they're less reliable. So it would be more of an investment of sort of time and energy. But yeah, it would, it would definitely provide an advantage. Was your intent to use um, purely mechanical fasteners for the joints between PVC pipe and printed parts or were yeah. you going to use adhesives? Yeah, it's, it's bolted together. Bolted, okay. Yeah. Um, I don't know if you guys have any experience with PETG, but I've had, uh, I, I really like PETG for my own personal parts. Right, okay. Yeah, yeah, that's, that is also an option. Um, and easier to print on process because you don't need the, that enclosure. So yeah, that's a good point. It's just not the, the inner layer adhesion is so good. So they nice. behave much more nice. isotropically than PLA. Yeah, I haven't used it much. So that's something to look into. Cool. Yeah. All right. Any other questions, comments on Brew and Bot? Uh, right. Not specific yeah. to Bruinbot, but just like as a general tip, I would advise still going a little bit more in detail into what Bruinbot was about. Like it, it's super convenient for me because I was here with the inception <laughs> of this project. Right. Um, but if, for example, if you were to give this out of context, it's probably a little harder to um, understand like everything. Like for example, the the PVC connectors, I I knew that, so I didn't have to ask. So stuff like that. Uh, doesn't yeah. have to be as like as in detail as obviously the new stuff that you guys are working on, but I would recommend you still kind of just be like, here's a quick dump of where we're at, or like previously. Yeah, that's a that's a good point. We just didn't put that in. <laughs> I didn't think of it. We're trying to keep it brief, but yeah, there's a lot a lot went into this project that I just assume everyone knows because I know it, but yeah, no, absolutely not the case. <laughs> it's a complex project. All right, um, yeah, let's let's move on to. Our second project then. All right, here we go. Matt, you want to introduce Bolt? Yeah, absolutely. So um, Bolt is like, uh, like the record just said, our, our newest project. This is one that was, uh, you know, was sort of conceived earlier in the fall quarter of uh, 2021. So basically the idea was pitched that um, Bolter Hall is a kind of, um, hostile place for newer students, right? It's a place where, you know, maybe they get lost looking for rooms and such. And it's it's a, it's a place where maybe it would be a nice place for a companion dog to be able to exist and uh, provide some comfort to the students, all right? This was the uh, idea that governed the inception of Bolt. So that's why it's named Bolt. It's named after both, I believe, a uh, Pixar movie character, if I'm not mistaken. And it is spelled in the style of uh, Bolt Hall. so. Yeah, there's a movie called Bolt about a dog, um, not a not a Pixar film, but that that was an, an inspiration. Yeah, oh, I'm supposed to skip that one. All right. <laughs> All right, what's up, guys? My name is Salim. Um, I was one of the two sub team leads for mechanical design for Bolt. Um, so basically, the main objectives this quarter were just we were kind of trying to figure out leg design and then how to actuate the legs. Um, so one of the key parts of this was we were kind of going back and forth about the implementation of a spine and how that would work because that kind of changes our leg design a lot. Um, if we could, we will, we want the dog to be able to turn while walking. Um, and so it, we could have easier leg design, um, and a spine and the spine could kind of facilitate that turning or no spine. And we have to have some extra actuation with the legs. So that's kind of something we've been going back and forth on this, uh, uh, during this time. Um, and basically number of joints and actuators, uh, that's kind of one of the main things of what we've been looking at this quarter. So the two kind of finalists for the leg design that um, we have at the moment, which we're gonna be finalizing this next week, but um, the two final candidates are the inverted leg design like spot, and then the non-inverted leg design, which is basically the knees kind of pointing towards each other. Um, so kind of just a little bit of pros and cons. There's a lot more references um, and people that have created uh, robot dogs like um, the inverted leg design. Um, it has a little bit more natural movement um, and the design implementation is gonna be a little easier. And obviously the legs are the same. So um, it's just kind of copy paste. 
Um, the, one of the main cons of that is that the symmetry of the non-inverted leg design gives some nice um, benefits and you lose those when you have um, this inverted leg design. So now moving on to the non-inverted leg design, of course, that symmetry is gonna give you a few, few pros. So the center of mass is gonna be in the middle, um, some easier calculations, some better stability. Um, but the cons, again, is gonna be, there's less references to existing designs. Um, and then again, like the, the movement is gonna be kind of a big one. So another thing that we were looking at is um, the sitting position. So um, as it's sketched out here for the inverted leg design, the sitting is going to be a little easier. So as it's sort of shown here, it's gonna support the weight a little better. And um, as you're seeing the ground contact, but this is kind of something we're still looking at. Um, this is again, just one of the aspects of choosing between the leg design. Yeah, I've kind of gone back and forth on this several times as I've been looking at these sketches um, because sometimes I look at it and I think one looks more natural and sometimes I think the other one looks more natural. I think the main thing it should come down to is probably the issue of the weight here, how um, the inverted leg design does not have the rear of the robot touch the ground, um, which makes it easier to stand up and sit down and it supports the weight better when it is in sitting position. Um, even though I think watching it sit down like it might look a little bit awkward because you expect the the leg to sort of bump up it's going to instead go under like backwards um i think that might be the thing that makes this design overall better but that's someplace we'd appreciate advice i think hi i'm uh daniel i'm the other um mechanical uh lead for uh, the legs and kinematics. Sorry, I don't have my camera on. I'm a bit under the weather. Um, but the next thing we uh, are deciding on is uh, the number of actuators for our legs. Um, and we've kind of come down to between eight and 12 actuators. Um, so with eight, um, it's a bit of a simpler design um, and it's a, a bit easier to control. Um, and it should still provide all the necessary like movement and stability we need for walking and turning while walking. Um, 12 gives us a lot more stability and more control. Um, and it definitely allows for that turning while moving. <clears throat> the main difference would be that, um, and this is where the spine kind of comes in. With the spine, we probably don't need to have that many actuators. Um, but without a spine, it would probably be better to have something more like 12. But I think we've decided on having a spine and I think uh, the chassis team will go more into this, but with the spine, it gives us a lot more um, flexibility and room to have the, the main body of the dog um, contribute to like the stability and the, the um, when turning with the, um, the movement of the legs, um, which should provide for uh, just easier turning overall if, with um, the implementation of that spine movement. Okay, so I'm going to talk a little bit more about this idea of a spine and how it relates to the way the dog moves. So I'm actually going to play part of this video. This is a video that I found that is actually intended for animators. So it's showing how to animate a dog walking. Um, but in our case, it actually relates a lot because we wanted to figure out how to create this walk cycle. Um, so I'm going to play only about two minutes of this video. Um, hopefully I can let me know if you hear the sound because I'm sharing it from my computer. Back. So now we have two halves, but how do they go together? You guys can hear him talking? Okay. Now there are four basic options. The front and rear end in step. The rear end a quarter of a cycle delayed. Half a cycle delayed. Or three quarters of a cycle delayed. Now which one is the correct one? Well, if you look at a dog walking, you realize that number one is out, and so too is number three. Number three is interesting, though, because it is used by the animal when breaking into a trot, that in-between thing between walk and run. But more about that later. That leaves us with a choice of either two or four. And even though they both look convincing, the correct way to walk on four legs is number four. 
The reason why it has to be version 4 becomes clear even without having film reference to hand. Let's look at the walks from above. With the front leg preceding the rear leg, the triangle formed by the contact points is extremely skinny and never really under the animal's center of gravity. In the correct version, the contact area is much larger and always supports the animal's weight. In version 2, a slow-moving dog would simply fall over. I don't think evolution would have liked that. Alright, so that's the area that was most relevant to the work we were doing, um, which I found Back. super interesting. So, as a review, what he's talking about is you can continue, consider the shoulders and the hips of the dog as independent entities that are moving, that are going on a cyclic motion of right foot, left foot, um, but they're doing that motion offset. So he goes over these several options of how you can offset those and decides on rear three quarter delayed from the front. So what that means is this triangle shows the, the contact points. So this is the area where the dog is supported. So it, the center mass will always remain under there. Whereas in this case, it, the center mass is almost never under the triangle. So it's really would be wobbling back and forth. So we're gonna try to use this type of walk cycle um, to create the most stability. Currently in our plans for this dog, we do not have dynamically controlled stepping or walking um, because we see that as basically too advanced a controls challenge for us to be thinking about at this point. So what we're going to try to do is create kind of a blind motion where the dog is, is walking, is going through these sequence of steps um, in, in an open loop kind of system. Uh, obviously not ideal for a robot in any dynamic world circumstance, um, like Spot or other uh, real life robots. Um, but we're going to start here and kind of work from it. So deciding on this, we've got this contact point. So from this idea of offsetting, I want to introduce the work that we've done on the spine. So I did a lot of kind of thinking about this of can we have this flexible spine, which we need to do for turning? Um, can we use that to create a more naturalistic motion, even when it's walking in a straight line? Obviously, it could be walking in a straight line with a rigid spine. Um, but I was kind of thinking about it from this context of can you create the spine as a even though it's flexible as a rigid and kinematic mechanism. So I'm just, I'm going through a little bit of how I'm defining the problem. Basically you've got two angles relative to the center line of the body. These angles are independent and depending on what these angles are, it'll create all of these different curvatures. Um, so this is a little animation that I made of what curvatures may be present depending on how those front and back cycles are aligned. So according to kind of what I'm thinking about it is it can be a kinematically solvable problem because you've got an input, which is what the shape of the spine is at any point. Um, and then the output is the correct relationship between these two angles. And that will create, um, if you think of sort of the spine as the base and then the front and the rear frames as extensions of the base, that'll create the correct angles between them um, if you're just actuating, actuating that curve. So it's a little bit, it's a little bit complicated. You know, people, you can ask me questions about this later. Um, so then the question becomes, how do you actuate a curvature itself? Um, and there are different ideas that we're thinking about right now. The most obvious one is you just break it up into rigid sections and you have one long robot arm and you put a motor, you know, at every joint. Um, so that could potentially work. However, you have all these motors out in the middle. Um, another strategy we're thinking about is uh, doing that actuation with strings or tension cables. So they're fixed to the midpoint of the spine. And then the length of the string is adjusted to bend this curvature one way or another. And then if you bend this one in one direction and this one in the opposite direction, you get an S shape. Or if you bend this one and this one in the same shape, you get a, a same direction, you get a C shape. So using motors placed over here and not in the middle, then you could create any number of curvatures. So that's the, the theory behind it. Um, we're still, you know, obviously going to work on thinking about how we could implement this in practice, but this is the work we've done so far. So the chassis and exterior team has done a little bit of work on the spine as well. So I'll have them talk about what their team's done. 
Yes. Uh, hello, my name is Christian. I'm the sub team lead for chassis and exterior and has, and it's pretty much been talked in length about already, but um, we have been working closely with the mechanical team this quarter to try and narrow down what we're going to be needing to build for our chassis because without the mechanical team's decisions on how the legs will work, it's kind of impossible to go at where we're supposed to start. But we did, or one of our team members did a quick CAD of what a potential spine could look like if it was platform-based and could potentially be moved with strings. And in his design, it either has three degrees of freedom or one. Um, and really the pros of this, because we want the dog to look as dog-like as possible and less like um, Spot or the Boston Dynamic dogs. So with the spine moving, it could make it look more realistic like dogs. And this kind of plays into what our team did for its exterior. And obviously the cons, which have been discussed, is that it's a lot more complicated to have a moving spine and how do we actuate that? And then also um, the, com the con of rigidity. We don't, if there's any heavy thing or if the spine weighs too much, it might not be able to support the weight of the dog. So we're gonna have to work around that. You can go to the next slide. And the other, or the other thing we worked on this quarter was the exterior design choices. And since we finally, or we decided on the moving spine, we had to come up with some, an exterior that either is kind of in pieces and mounts at different locations that can all slide around each other or something like a print and place design where it'll have passive movement, uh, the pit, like an armadillo shell where the plates will move underneath each other and just slide over the top. And then that picture of the thing being printed is like a 3D printed slug. And that's just to show you how those pieces uh, connect with each other and how they uh, are able to move. Uh, and our idea for this quarter is to try and extend that to be a larger shape like the armadillo shell <clears throat> and still um, have rigidity, but also be able to move with the spine and the legs. Uh, and on this makes it a lot cheaper to do, and we can iterate on it much more easily because we can just 3D print a new one if it doesn't work. Um, the only con really that I could come up with is that it's probably going to be more complicated to model this and design it because we will have to make sure it can still move um, when it's done printing. And then some smaller things we talked about during the quarter were things like the dog's ears and how we could make that look more realistic, like move them and touch sensors on the head, which I think the control will go into more. Um, and then where we have to place our motors and electronics so that the dog's still able to walk. And then those pictures are kind of the idea we had with the ears is to just use string that threads in between the pieces and the ear could be in multiple um, sections and then a servo motor could uh, tighten it to make it go down and then loosen it to go back up. Uh, hey everyone, I'm Rohan. I'm one of the computer science uh, leads for Bolt. Sorry for the lack of a camera. Uh, I don't have a working one for my device right now, but I'll get into a bit of what we talked about during the fall quarter. So one of the biggest uh, design uh, features that we discussed was developing this quadrupedal robot from scratch or using a pre-existing uh, program. So one of the uh, programs we researched was called uh, ROS, which stands for Robot Operating System. Uh, this was basically like an all-in-one package for controlling a robot. Uh, you can see a few of the examples on the top right. Those are actual um, like CAD models of what uh, ROS can do. Uh, you can see uh, it has like a lot of control uh, with how to move the legs and an additional robotic arm. But as you can see, uh, it's kind of complex and that's one of the cons. It has a high learning curve and it has no room for things like a tail or ears or a spine like we talked about. But one of the, some of the pros are that it's useful in industry 
and there are lots of examples of it working. So uh, because of this inability to customize, uh, we plan to do it with Scratch. Uh, and I can go into that on the next slide a bit about why we did that. Uh, so the pros of doing uh, this project from the ground up with custom robot code, uh, like I said, gives more flexibility to work with the spine, the tail, the ears. And also it's a great learning experience for all of us since we're all kind of new to developing quadrupedal robots. Uh, the cons, like I said, uh, in comparison to ROS, this is kind of uncharted waters with how to move uh, with a four-legged robot, um, which is slightly different to Guardian in the past years because we might have to do with balance and things like that. But uh, that is something we will have to deal with later. Uh, I'll leave it to Ethan to discuss uh, the rest. Hi, so I'm Ethan. I'm the other sub-team lead for CS and controls. And so um, the, the thing about um, trying to create our code from scratch is that it was super daunting for us to try and do that because like Rohan said, none of us had much experience working with quadrupedal locomotion. And so what we decided is we actually got a, a detailed walkthrough of Guardian's code and learned a lot about how legs move and the spe specifically the movement of Guardian and how that worked. And so in that, in that workshop, we, we came to understand how legs moved and how um, we can implement that for bolts. And so after having that uh, workshop, we, we realized that um, making our code and creating our code from scratch was actually potentially a lot easier than we thought. And so we can go to the next slide. And so our final decision in the fall was to um, make a dog that's more dog-like than say Boston Dynamics. So we chose custom over RRS mainly because of the fact that we could use Guardian's code to sort of use that as base code um, so that we had something to base our code off. So it wasn't so daunting for us to try and create our code from scratch. And so some of the behaviors we discussed and decided on was um, listening to commands from a human. So using a speaker and a mic to listen to commands and um, do things like barking or growling or stuff that a normal dog would do. Um, reaction to being pet. So there'd be touch sensors on the dog to um, recognize when it's being touched by a human and doing things like wagging its tail because I mean, dogs are happy when they get pet. And then um, doing things like moving to designated locations, whether that's autonomously or manually, which also requires understanding and recognizing surroundings. So we'd use things like um, uh, ultrasonic sensors or infrared sensors to be able to decide where it is in space. And also a light sensor for sleep cycles. So we wanted it to be kind of uh, have the dog understand what time of day it is so that it can go to sleep at night and stuff like that. And so as we were saying earlier, this is relatively new for all of us on in the software side. And so um, some kind of things that we may need help with is um, anyone with experience with controls of a robot and like uh, quadrupedal locomotion, but uh, any help would be nice. Thank you. Yeah, so um, just to kind of summarize everything and to uh, look forward, we have um, sort of, well, this is, these are our plans mainly for the, uh, the winter quarter. So um, yeah, Mechanical is gonna be working on finalizing the leg design. Uh, this is gonna be something that, uh, well, it's an X1 first. We've, we've emphasized quadrupedal locomotion a lot, but um, we really wanna make sure that we get things right in terms of correct joint dimensions and such um, for all the legs. And we wanna make sure that that translates into a smoothly moving robot. So yeah, as a part of that is deciding the overall dimensions. Yeah, and naturally into CADM as well. So, um, but for the chassis and exterior, generally we're gonna start work with the, uh, the most essential parts of the robot. Well, it actually creates something that's able to stand freely. And that's to start work on the spine and the body itself and where that body connects to the, uh, the actual legs. 
so I can't remember that. Um, yeah, and there's also the uh, intense, uh, I think Christian described, of uh, designing and presenting the, and uh, printing the exterior shell. For CS and controls, um, it is, if applicable, which probably will if we have a lot of sensors for these behaviors, is to uh, actually start purchasing the electronics and sensors. This is something we had to hope to do a little bit earlier than other, project, than other uh, parts of the project in terms of purchasing, because if um, essentially as soon as the controls team is able to get their hands on sensors, they're able to start uh, experimenting with them and getting feedback on how they work as soon as possible. And uh, this is something we intend to do in the future with a uh, little more Raspberry Pi training, getting everyone familiar with those sort of uh, microcontrollers and using them. So um, yeah, and then naturally, a um, big part of that is just working on programming behaviors and working on Lube and the robot. Yeah, all right. So that was that was a lot about the conceptualization of this robot. Um, does anyone have any questions about the things we presented? I mean, if you'll allow me to rapid fire some comments real quick, I For promise sure. I won't take up too much time. Yeah. Uh, first of all, this is really badass. Um, oh, thank I, you. I really want to see where you guys go with this. This is awesome. A um, couple quick things. Uh, robot operating system is referred to as ROS. So if you just say ROS, that works. Um, sorry, if uh, please don't <laughs> take offense by me correcting you. That's just the standard. It's called ROS. Yeah. Um, and then the main thing that I'm concerned about is typically when you see these types of dog or quadrupedal or, or even any like uh, mimicking animal motion, they tend to use actuators as opposed to motors. Uh, difference mm -hmm. being that these actuators are custom units that tend to have some kind of internal mechanism of producing artificial stiffness, artificial um, impedance, artificial dampening, all these kinds of more complex things that your traditional servo is not going to be able to give you. So I'm really curious how you guys go around, go about tackling that because um, I think that's going to be a probably your biggest challenge because i think if you have rigid motion with the servo um you might end up like bouncing the entire system up and down and then it like tipping over as opposed to it being kind of absorbed um i would reach out to uh professor hong's lab romella because i know they have the custom bear actuators i mean obviously they're i doubt they're going to give you them as loaners yeah <laughs> um but i mean it, there are some really smart minds in there and i'm sure if you just kind of picked out a couple of them and were like hey we're trying to do artificial stiffness but like obviously we have a low budget any advice um i think that would take you guys a really long way um just because i kind of first see that being a problem down the line um not to say yeah. that this is can't be done like obviously guardian survived without it but then again that that walking gate is i'd say very different. significantly different um but no, this is awesome. I'm so glad you guys are taking this as a challenge. This looks really cool. All the work you guys did for all the sub teams for this on Bruin Bot looks awesome. Um, feel free to reach out to me again. I know I, hopefully the, it sounds like the Guardian workshop I gave didn't deter you guys too much. So um, yeah, feel free to reach out to me if you guys have any controls or more code questions about that. I'll be happy to help. This looks um, awesome. Great job for everyone involved. Seriously, this is awesome. I. It warms my heart seeing this is a, where X1 is going, so. Oh, thank you, John. Thank yeah. you so much. Yeah, thanks, John. Appreciate it. Yeah, I'm in, I'm in Hong's capstone right now, so I'll hopefully be able to maybe maybe pose the question. Um, yeah, we're entirely limited by budget. That's just what it comes down to. So maybe, yeah, maybe they know of some some cheaper alternatives to the bear actuators. Right. It, it could just be like you guys find out some way to have the servos work in series with a i don't know torsional spring or some, something but right. I, I think that's going to be if you just had rigid servo motion i have a feeling you're going to have a problem yeah our what's in our plan right now is like because you have spot has these right ends the of flexures. its legs like we're mm -hmm. going to have something that's doing that that's providing some dampening in the leg itself right but fair that might um, not be enough yeah yeah, like I said, I could be very wrong. I just that's typically how these are made. They have like an they'll refer to it as an actuator, which does possess those abilities all like mm -hmm. um, digitally. So maybe there's a workaround with the servo. But yeah, uh, awesome. Yeah, thanks so much. Yeah, thanks for bringing that up. That's a really uh, I think critical point. You know, that seems like uh, something I I didn't totally consider beforehand was that there might be like a 
really significant controls aspect to working with Lawrence. And uh, yeah, I'm still bringing flashbacks to 82 and I'm in one less lab right now, so. <laughs> yeah, sadly, it will come up. If anyone is in the robotics series, the 163, I think, series, it is in Santos's 163C. It's the last course in that series where they'll talk about this kind of stuff. Um, yeah, like I said, feel free to reach out if anyone's interested. I still have my notebooks and all that stuff. <laughs> sure. All right. Thank you. Uh, I think you're, I am a little skeptical about the spine right now right uh, to be honest um, fair enough i think you're gonna have so you're gonna have a big issue with rigidity and then the other thing is um i think something that um you may have just glanced over is that if you you made the whole point about how the dog walks with the animation and that the center of mass of the dog is in the middle right over where um how the legs walk right well, that means that you need to design the center of mass of your robot to be in the same spot. Um, so not only does this spine need to be able to support itself, you're probably going to put other heavy electronics like the control stuff and the battery underneath it. Yeah. So not only does it need to, it's, um, and when you're using, if you're using cables, cables are only strong in one direction. They can only do tension. They don't do compression. Yeah. So you see how there's a cable on either side. I, yeah. But then if it, is bent the other way. Well, yeah, so think about if, imagine that both of these blue lines are like super rigid. They're super strong in that position, being being pulled, right? You can't pull it, in either, you can't push it in either direction. Because if you if you push it in the direction where one is weak, the yeah. other one is strong. I'm still very, I'm still very skeptical about. Yeah, I mean, using I know cables I know for anything instead of a rigid body is. It's preliminary, but it's, um, I, I'm still very skeptical. I think that you could, I understand that the motion wouldn't be quite as fluid, but you could put, you only have two degrees of freedom. You only need two motors. You can have a rigid beam with a motor on each end that act, that turns. If you look at all of those other dog designs that you showed, all of them use three motors, three actuators per leg. Um, and I think yeah. there's a reason mm -hmm. for that. I'm not saying you have to do that, but Right. So if like you have three actuators per leg, a bunch of three D printed parts that are loosely held together by cables is not going to cut it. I, okay. I really don't think that's going to. I really don't think it's going to be strong enough. It's. I mean, we don't know. We don't know what this is made out of. First right. off, part of this is balanced side to side with the legs, but it is also going to be balanced front and back. Mm -hmm. So that's the the advantages we we're talking about earlier of. Um, some of the leg designs have symmetry, which creates sort of a symmetry in the whole robot. Right. You know, we haven't thought about head, the head or tail or any of that. Like that's a complication. Um, yeah, I under I understand what you're saying. Um, I just think we're not far enough along in this design yet to to know what the real challenges are. I, I obviously it being rigid is a challenge. Yeah. Another thing that I'm almost definitely would include is each one of these joints, whether it has a motor on it or not, has a torsional spring on it. Right. So, would help so a each, lot. Each of those joints being vertical. Yes. It's going to put a lot of, because it's not going to be perfectly manufactured, it's going to put a lot of pressure on them bending this way, um, which I think yeah. is going to be an issue. I think, I honestly think you guys should design the spine first and then the legs. How would we change the legs design based on oh but whether we can even have an actuated spine or not? Um, I guess not necessarily. I guess it, I guess I'm assuming that it wouldn't the leg design wouldn't be the same either way you go. But I guess that's not true if you're just going to make the same leg design. Well, we can't really have an eight actuator leg design if we don't have the spine because then we have no way to turn pretty much at all. If you've got the third actuator in each leg, then each leg can shift like this, and then it can take a step that's not straightforward. It can take a step right. that's this direction, and that's how uh, a dog actually turns. You know, yeah, it it does right. that I in still, addition to moving its spine. I still think you can definitely do uh, a non-rigid spine, but I think that I mean like a not like you don't need eight you don't need 
you don't need three actuators for like you can get away with just having two other ones that control the motion you could yeah. even do um right it's not as elegant but like you could do two linear actuators that pull and push um i guess yeah i think i think the, the right, cable design would, is something that would need to be prototyped pretty extensively those, um, those bars would just need to be so strong and uh also really uh like very well very well manufactured so that the joints don't wear out um sure yeah i mean that's that's true of anything in this robot isn't it well except they just have extra force on them in the way that they're not designed you're basically putting sheer force on the screws if you or whatever whatever kind of rod you're going through because it's bending the other in the opposite direction because this why, why? the legs aren't going to stand up on their own they're going to either want to fall in or fall out uh yeah i guess so that's going to put that's either going to put that's going to put sheer force on all the joints in this one way or the other it's going to want to arch like a real okay guy. yeah mm -hmm. if if i may chime in real quick um sure. I know this. I know this is kind of stemming from what we tried to do with Guardian towards the end of, or I guess, beginning of last year, uh, where we were trying to replace our three servo actuation with a more slinky, you know, this kind of a cable system. And yeah. I know they were having some real hard times getting out the forces that they needed to get this thing to be feasible. I would reach out to Hayato because I know he was heavily involved with that project. I don't know if you already have. Sorry if you already have. Um, but I would recommend reaching out to him. But honestly, I, I, I think there is quite a bit of merit in the linear actuator design that Jacob just proposed. Might want to look into that. That's, I, I can see that working pretty well. Um, but I, I say, you know, I'm always of the mindset of X1 is first and foremost a learning experience. You know, we're not a, we're not a business. It's okay if we flop. Obviously, like it's, it's awesome for, um, what's it called, sorry, uh, the Engineering Alumni Association to see like, here's a working product. Obviously that's awesome, but there's a lot of merit in you guys learning so much stuff that I'm gonna be real with you. The, the job that I'm working at now, most of it came from X1, maybe quarter of it came from schooling. And that's a, a trend that I'm sure most engineers will <laughs> you know, confirm. Um, so I say go for it, but yeah, I, I, I think Jacob's onto something, unfortunately, just to be aware of. Okay. Yeah, we'll we'll look into that for sure. Real dogs are really <laughs> biology is complicated, <laughs> and making it is even more difficult. I don't, yeah, I can see how you can. Okay, you can, I, the argument I made I think is sound where you have a bunch of other examples of robots like this and none of them do it this way. But the kind of argument is that to that is all those are trying to be better robots and this is trying to mimic nature better. Um, is, it's not yeah is, it's not trying to be a particularly good I robot i guess valid um, yeah i mean my my thinking behind this difficult. my thinking behind this i'll just quickly mention is that i don't see it having to deal with very serious forces opposing the way that these strings are pulling and maybe i'm, I'm wrong in that because i don't know how much things are going to weigh you know i things are balanced but the idea is everything is rigidly held on a horizontal plane the only force is shifting it left or right. You know, it's not trying to create three degrees of freedom, like up and down motion. It's right. everything's so on a plane. That would be true and if it was it's a just, snake. Yeah. But it's not. If it's what? If it was a snake, if it was actually on the ground. The issue is that it's not on the ground and you're going to have um, force. Bending. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, as, you, as you've mentioned. Yeah. yeah. That's... That's where I would worry about this. Yeah, okay. That's a good point. Yeah, I'm certainly just uh, I'm thinking of some workarounds right now in my head, that particular problem, but uh, it's definitely something you should address in future meetings in regards to uh, avoiding that arching and such. But yeah, um, I, no, I, I love that. 3D. I actually, well, I guess we, I, we don't have really have an idea of how big this robot is, but 
we've in stipulated theory, to be no longer than around a meter or three feet in length. Well, that would I think that would be quite large. No, it's not going to be that big. Um, I, I like you could run calculations and do some FDA, but I really don't think three D printing is a good idea for chassis pieces um, that are structural like this. You got to have some kind of backbone of something that's. I mean, it doesn't need to be metal, but it should be some solid something. That's, I know it, it you run into a lot of issues when you start getting, running down those roads, but I, I just so, don't know it would be strong enough. I'm going to put in my two cents here. Um, sure. Uh, 3D printing is fantastic for, for making crazy custom shapes, and it would be great to 3D print a uh, spine just to okay. see how it moves. Um, you know, uh, if you're going to, if you're going to make anything, uh, even if you make it out of metal, you would 3D print it first just to see how it goes together. Um, so I don't think 3D printing or not should be a particularly big issue. You're going to print, you, if you build it, you're going to 3D print it either way. Um, the comment with regards to forces on the pole wires on either side um, is probably relevant. Um, the forces that you're going to see are going to come from the fact that you've got two feet touching the ground on, say, like the back. And then you've got one foot touching the ground on, say, the front. And as the two feet in the back try to articulate, um, uh, they are going to change the relative twist of the um, of the spine as they as they turn. So so you've got the yeah they're, they're going to try and make the spine. Okay, so here's the two feet. Oh, I align this. Okay, so as one foot tries to take a step forward, it's gonna it's gonna cause the spine to do this, and then as the other foot steps forward, it's gonna cause the spine to do that. Um, but uh, the only way for the spine to carry zero forces would be if, um, well, sorry, what will happen is as the spine uh, changes from an S shape to a straight line and back, um, it's going to want to, that's changing the distance from the point of contact of the third, um, uh, uh, say like the, the front leg that's touching the ground. That right. leg is going to want to rub and slide forward or backward. And based on the friction that that has with the ground, it's either going to slide or it's going to cause the spine to take on a vertical arch. Um, so that's where your forces are going to come from. And um, it's what, what you got here is actually really complicated, even if you were going to try and simulate it from like, FEA, or if you're going to try and do like some kinetic simulation and say atoms, um, it's a pretty difficult problem to set up. Yeah. Um, from your end, you're going to get a lot more benefit just building a prototype, like like printing a prototype. You're going to see a lot more, a lot quicker from from trying to build a prototype than you are from trying to simulate it. Because I guarantee that if you try and set up the simulation, you're not going to set it up right. Um, yeah. So scale models are always your friend. Okay. Build it smaller um, in advance, and you'll see the issues before you try and go big and waste weeks of you know printer time or waste of weeks of fabrication time. Um, just print a small version of it, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Sounds good. Yeah. Thank. Thanks. Thanks so much, everyone, for <laughs> giving feedback on it. Um, yeah, as much as I want to believe that, like, oh, this is the way to do it, you know, <laughs> I'm usually wrong. So, well, no one, no one knows. I think that's actually really good advice. Um, I, I think we have a tendency to want to find the solution. Well, I, I come up with a bunch of solutions, pick the one, and just know that it's the right one and run with it. But I don't think that's how it works. I guess I don't know how it works in the real world, but it seems like that's not how it works in the real world. And maybe that's not how we should do things, especially if we have a two year production cycle for these robots, we have a lot more time. But we yeah. can spend just yeah. the next two quarters prototyping this. And then yeah. actually figure out what's the best solution. 
Yeah, sounds like a plan. Yeah, please don't be discouraged. I, I know this sounds like, oh, this isn't going to work. Stop. But th that's certainly not what any of us are saying. We just want you to be aware of what's going on, um, at least in our heads, which is, you know, not your head. So just any outside information is helpful. Um, please keep going with this. I would love to see where this ends up. And like I said, um, learn from this. I, you know, obviously, like I said, it's cool to show, e, you know, engineering alumni, this is what we did. But if you learn, it's way more valuable. Trust me. Yeah, thanks, guys. Thank you. All right. Yeah. Um, anything else from Bolt? We're, little, we're over time, so I recognize that people have to leave um, or if we want to just wrap it up. All right. Um, yeah, that's pretty much it. Yeah, we just got, you know, here's our contact information. Um, if you want to send us comments afterwards, you don't want to say them in the meeting for whatever reason, um, we definitely accept all of your input. If you want to sketch out ideas or tell us more things, um, yeah, here's how you can do that. So thanks everyone so much for coming. And um, that will conclude this design review.